And good morning and welcome to a new discussion from the How to Film Finance webinar series sponsored by our friends at Rapbook. Uh, my name is Robin Burt. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Membership for the Independent Film and Television Alliance and the American Film Market taking place in Santa Monica on October 31. Today's session brings together experts from our industry discussing topics that include conducting market research, how to obtain international potential revenue estimates, creating a sales package, securing pre-sales agreements, um, enhancing investor confidence, and mitigating financial risk. And before we get going, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Rapbook, the industry's only self-service platform for employer of record payroll and accounting. And now we'd like to show a very short video from Rapbook. And before we get started, uh, we will be taking uh, questions from the audience today. Click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, and we will address as many as we can in the allotted time. I'd now like to introduce our moderator, Patrick Brusotti, who is the CEO for Blue Fox Financing, a transitional digital platform to streamline and, and expedite film financing opportunities for the entertainment industry and connecting borrowers with the largest database of film and television lenders and gap financiers. And now over to you, Patrick, and your great, great uh, uh, panelists. Thank you very much, Robin. And thank you, uh, Bill, Matt, and Jennifer and IFTA for putting this event on. Um, we This is our second one of a three-part series of how to. The first one was on debt uh, and gap financing, which was incredibly um, insightful um, for me as a moderator, just to be able to hear all the panelists' um, opinions on, on that. Uh, today, we our focus, as mentioned, is on um, pre-sales, um, both on the uh, domestic and international side. Um, as everybody knows, it's a huge part of how films are financed. And something from my perspective as a producer is always been kind of elusive, um, especially from when you're on the outside looking in. You know, I, I was never quite sure um, how much of a quote unquote package you need before exploring sales companies, distributors, and going out and doing pre sales. So, with that, today we have a fantastic panel. Um, that collectively encompasses a full range of expertise and experience in not only the international pre-sale side, but also the U.S. market as well. Um, so first up, I'd like to introduce uh, Jordan Fields. Hey, Jordan, how you doing? Hello. Uh, Jordan, uh, I'll sing everyone's praises a little bit before we dive in. Uh, so Jordan uh, has been the head of content acquisitions for Shout since 2007. Um, he's worked directly with marketing, sales, and finance to fill Shout, uh, Shout's slate of theatrical releases. Um, over the years, Jordan has brought in some of the Shout's biggest brands, including Mystery Science Theater 3000, which is, I love that uh, series, by the way, uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse, 
Leica Studios and iconic collections from Mel Brooks to um, Steve Martin. Jordan also oversees development of Shout's original productions. Um, their Western Old Henry starring Tim Blake Nelson was a selection at the 2021 Venice International Film Festival. And the remake of Roger Corman's Slumber Party Massacre is 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, recent acquisitions from Shout include the romantic comedy What's Love Caught to Do With It with uh, Lily James starring and The Kill Room starring uh, Uma Thurman and Samuel Jackson. And that film's uh, being released later this month. Thanks, Jordan, for uh, jumping on. Thank you for uh, having me. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Maxime Cotre. Uh, Maxine Thanks. oversees the production and financing at the independent film um, sales and distribution company XYZ Films. Uh, he produces and executive produces many of the company's titles, including the upcoming Seven Veils starring, uh, starring Amanda Siffery, which just premiered in the main competition at TIFF. Uh, Maxime also oversees international sales and spearheads the execution of all financing arrangements. And most recently, he helped oversee the raising of a uh, $100 million uh, production fund for XYZ. We are currently working with Maxime on a $5 million film now, and they have been fantastic in providing pre-sales for that movie. Uh, thanks, Maxime, for jumping on. I know you're not feeling too hot Thank today, or appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Juliet Berman uh, is a hands-on film producer who shepherds each project from inception all the way through the development and packaging phase. Uh, she runs point on set and in post um, and is in very much a part of the distribution sales strategy and consults with distributors on marketing and publicity. Uh, she pretty much does everything soup to nuts as an independent producer. Um, since forming her company, Spiral Stairs Entertainment in 2023, uh, she has produced two independent features, including the remake of the 1981 cult classic, Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Uh, prior to that, she spent the last 10 years at, as an independent financier um, at Treehouse Pictures, where she managed an in-house fund for development and production. And we're also working with Juliet um, recently in the past within our marketplace, and she's been amazing. Um, and then last but not least, we have Mr. James Huntsman. How are you doing, James? Good day. Uh, yeah, James owns Blue Fox Entertainment, which is a fantastic U.S. distributor and international sales company. Uh, I, James, I know you're not big on bios, but I'll take a stab anyway. Um, Blue Fox Entertainment releases and sells approximately uh, 20 to 25 movies a year. Uh, one of the many great things about Blue Fox is their ability to release films theatrically in the U.S. wide across the country. Um, and I believe uh, they are the third largest independent um, theatrical distributor in the U.S. behind A24 and Neon. Uh, and Blue Fox has the ability to release an independent film in over a thousand screens. Um, and uh, James is also my partner on Blue Fox Financing. So with that long winded um, uh, intro, uh, thank you for for uh, for listening. Um, I would love for each of you to just maybe uh, give a little bit more detail on your background and your companies. Um, James, if you don't mind starting off. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you all for taking the time to listen to us talk about uh, a part of the industry that's very near and dear to all of us and something quite critical to the future and viability of the industry that we all love. Uh, Blue Fox Entertainment has been around since about 2015. Um, as Patrick mentioned, we do about 20 to 25 films a year. Um, uh, our real emphasis is, is to find those movies that can work theatrically in the United States. And if films can work theatrically in the United States and use that as a foundation for the eventual release, the ancillary uh, revenues in the United States and potentially the international revenues uh, of that project, um, have a likelihood of being significantly higher. Um, so that's one of the reasons why Blue Fox Entertainment has such an emphasis on theatrical. It is also kind of a forgotten art as somebody who grew up uh, watching the direct-to-video slasher movies in the 80s, but also being a fan of going to uh, the, the movie theater and seeing a film on a big screen. I've never lost that passion, and we feel very much that that market and industry is not going away anytime soon. 
Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Uh, Jordan, if you don't mind jumping in, just again, um, giving a little bit more detail on um, your position at Shout, Shout, and, and Shout as a company as well. Uh, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I, I had the acquisitions uh, efforts here and oversee the originals. Um, so Shout start, well, let's see. In the beginning, there was Rhino and it was good. And if you know Rhino, then you know that they were known for super serving fans and really bringing out these incredibly fan friendly collections of uh, video and audio releases. The, the reason I mentioned Rhino is because it was founded by two guys, one of whom, after they sold Rhino to Warner Music Group, started Shout Factory with his two partners. And the three guys have owned uh, Shout Factory since 2003. We just celebrated our 20th anniversary, and I don't know if there was some press about the fact that we were rebranding ourselves as Shout Studios, and part of the reason for that is to alter the perception of Shout as uh, what we started out to be, which was a home video distributor in the early days, re-releasing lots of classic television and films, having licensed <clears throat> them from uh, independents and studios. And much like Rhino, we carried that, that spirit of super serving fans and really, you know, releasing these things with, you know, remaster, remastered, um, great extras, all the things that that we that fan that you all as fans and we at Shout as fans love. Over the years, Shout evolved in um, very substantial ways, uh, uh, expanding its distribution muscle by acquiring a um, broader array of rights and acquiring new films along the way and releasing them across all distribution windows. And we built, we were early movers in the channel space, SVOD, AVOD, Fast Channels, uh, and have acquired thousands of titles uh, in our library. And the library is a, is a big part of what we do, but we're expanding and again, always trying to evolve and stay relevant with the times, uh, whether it's through increasing our theatrical muscle, the channels, originals. Um, so we are, uh, it's a, it's a really fun place to work. I, I'm sure if you know the kind of content we have, it's a really fun place to work. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jordan. Uh, Maxine, if you don't mind, again, just elaborating a little bit more on XYZ and your background within it. Sure. Well, I mean, XYZ is, where do I start? We, we started out as a production company back in 2008. And over the last 15 years, have organically expanded into domestic sales, international sales, talent management, financing, and most recently, U.S. distribution. And so as a result, we view ourselves today as an independent studio. And the entire genesis behind that is, you know, this will be relevant to a lot, we, a lot of what we talk about today, is transform ourselves into a company that can take a movie from the earliest development through to the end consumer and kind of be the master of our own destiny. Um, where I fit into that is my background personally, as I was a financier for many years, in the UK at Ingenious. And, you know, as you mentioned, originally I came in with a view to kind of developing the financing arm of XYZ. And that's just very organically transformed into, you know, basically having my fingers in every piece of the pie. Um, and yeah, so, and, and as a company itself as well, we specialize particularly in genre films. What genre means to us is action, sci fi, thrill, and horror. The, major part of that besides just a personal taste thing is just that's what we've made on a, a name for ourselves in and so a lot of it is focusing on those with an overarching emphasis also on filmmakers that is to say you know the filmmaker for us is the most important piece of the puzzle in any movie and so yeah so we can we see as a filmmaker driven genre studio Awesome. I can't wait to, to jump in with all of you guys and talk about in more detail on the pre-sale side. But Juliet, if you don't mind, please just give a little bit more of a background, you know, your, your background. If, and certainly if I missed anything um, would be really helpful. Sure. Um, well, there's not much to say about Spiral Stairs because it's me and it's pretty new. But uh, I think I represent the voice of the independent producer. And, you know, when I went over to Treehouse in 2012 and, and kind of built that company with my partner there, we talked a lot about making the kinds of movies that we want to see. And we talked a lot about independent film as, um, you know, there had become in our in our view, this divide of like there's indie film and there's commercial film and never the two shall meet. And indie film is like this art film that has a really tiny audience and not a big market. And then there's like the commercial stuff that people will pay to go see. And so we really tried to 
make things that lived in that sweet spot in the middle. Um, and that's something that I've really carried with me into my work. I, you know, I have not gone into the studio system for a reason because I'm really passionate about independent film and independent cinema and those kinds of stories and, and that kind of, you know, filmmaking. But at the same time, I think that there's a version of that that is commercial, that has a big audience, that doesn't feel like homework, that feels like something that people are excited to go see. Um, and that's something that I've really focused on in my career. I think Don't Tell Mom is a great example. That's an independent film. The original was also an independent film, um, you know, but we really approached it with an indie style. Even when I work with Netflix and I made movies like Set It Up, that was an independent film. Um, so I think that that's been a really big touchstone in my career is like, how do you find something that lives in both of those spaces? And then, like you said, I'm really hands on every step of the way and and have gotten more hands on over the years. In the beginning of Treehouse, it was let's take a, a project, build a package, go pre-sell foreign. We put our money up against domestic, we go make the movie. And I think as we've all seen, it's gotten more challenging to just have one model that you plug and play. And part of the producer's job is to figure out how do I get this movie made? <laughs> Movies yeah. don't want to be made <laughs> and we have to, we have to get them made. And so I think I've had to learn so many different sides of that as I've, you know, gone on in my career is just, okay, what's a new path to getting this done or what's an old path that I could re-explore. And it's kind of become a, a puzzle that, that you put together differently every time. Yeah. Um, so I've gotten to learn more of every side of it than just kind of now I go make my movie and now I deliver my movie. Uh, cool. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and again, I can't wait to really get into the weeds with all of you because I, I do have a lot of questions that really, frankly, I want answered. Even have been in this industry for a while and have made a number of movies. I, I'm really excited to hear your take on some of these questions. But with that said, I'm going to, um, Maxime, I, I like to lob a, more of a softball, simple question out of the gate to you, just for anyone who's listening that may not fully understand the benefits of pre-selling a film. Um, can you do me a favor and just uh, just explain some of the benefits of pre-selling the films you are producing internally, along with third party um, producers working with <clears throat> XYZ? Yeah, yeah. Um... I wonder how to answer this question. I think the overarching point is that it's a risk mitigation thing, but I think it's best explained maybe in its historical context. You know, up until let's say the 1980s, any independent film as different to an, a studio film, for it to be financed, you basically needed equity, right? You needed somebody to come along and write a check for you, which was simply, you know, money to make your movie. And I think, you know, and there are many people who've claim to have invented this, but with the advent of, I guess at the time would have been VHS and, you know, TV networks, you know, showing movies, there was this realization that you could, you could pre-sell the distribution or exhibition rights to your film to a distributor and they'd give you, you know, money up front for that, often called an MG, right? A minimum guarantee. And that MG, which came in the form of a contract, provided collateral you could theoretically take to a, a bank or a lender. And that bank or lender could basically give you money up front against the value of this contract. And what people then realized was instead of having to rely on the wits of a, you know, a high net worth rich person, you know, who hopefully will write you a several million dollar check, you could, off the basis of the package you put together, the strength of your material, you could go to distributors like Jordan and, you know, pre-sell the rights to the movie in that specific territory to them, and then effectively use that collateral when you go to your bank to effectively finance your movie, right? And so it became a thing where, you know, it, it effectively became the paradigm of financing independent films for the better part of the last 30, 40 years, which is you used, you used markets, in order to go launch films and you know use that as a means of either fully financing your film or at least to a large degree let's just use some round numbers you have a five million dollar movie and you pre-sold three million dollars in rights it meant that the gap that you had to plug when you went to an equity financier for example was smaller right and therefore from their perspective it you know it hedged risk and so you know the benefit if you will of pre-selling films is to hedge risk and also just to you know it's a it's a means of financing your movie 
in effect. You know, it's a more structured means as well. It's less reliant on, you know, the 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 you know particular opinion of of you know somebody rich who's willing to give you some money. And so, you know, I think a lot of what we'll talk about is, you know, this effective paradigm of financing movies, I think pretty much created to a large degree all of us as producers and as companies kind of created the 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 business we work in or sustained it at least and i think a lot of what we'll talk about today is how we still use you know and julia you touched on this we still use that model to a certain degree but it is it's changed you know it's like the this yeah. this entire model as i'm sure we'll get into mm -hmm. it used to be underpinned by VHS, DVD sales, TV sales, these things, you know, to a certain degree no longer exist or at least exist only for a certain kind of movie. So we're in this new phase of reinventing everything and, you know, effectively figuring out how to monetize it. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the question. Um, Jordan, you know, everyone that works with Shout, I, I know, because within our marketplace, we see a lot of people that have worked with you or are working with you, and everyone has nothing but great things to say about Shout uh, universally, uh, okay. including me. Um, I, I'd love to hear your insight on, as a U.S. distributor, um, from a pre-sale standpoint, um, how important is a U.S. Uh, MG component to your company versus, for example, an acquisition? Um, is there a certain balance that you try to find of finding projects early on where you could do a pre-sale um, versus just waiting for the film to complete? And, and how do you evaluate that? I would say when you when you when you in an acquisition scenario, you get to see the film you know exactly what you're getting. And there's a real value to that. Um, in a pre-buy scenario, that's what we generally call these pre-buy scenarios, uh, you're buying a dream and that dream can be wonderful. Um, you're certainly banking on that. Uh, and the dream is uh, fueled by the elements of the package. They are the, the cast, the, um, the budget, the people, uh, the creatives behind it, um, any marketing driver connected with that title, what's going on in the in the general marketplace that might enhance the marketability of this title. There are lots of elements that you consider when you're looking at at that at a, at a, at a movie that has not been made yet. Because at the end of the day, a movie can be fantastic on paper in all respects and just not turn out that great. Um, it's funny. I was just at the Toronto Film Festival. Uh, this last week and you know when you go to these uh, press and industry screenings you sometimes you get there and you hear people talking in a couple of rows in front of you and you can't help but overhear it and I remember I heard one person say you know my client uh, um, bought um, a lot of movies here and they just hate them <laughs> um, they just didn't turn out and that happens. So uh, on the one hand, a finished film is, is great because, again, you know exactly what you're getting. Uh, on the other hand, when you come in early on a, on a film, you could potentially get it for a, a better price mm -hmm. um, and, and get it at all. You know, if you have a relationship with mm. the producer, for example, um, you might have that movie, uh, whereas when it's finished and it's really good, it gets really expensive, especially if it's at a Toronto Film Festival, for example, or a Sundance. So there are, you know, there are pros and cons to the acquisition and pros and cons to the to the pre-buy. Uh, interesting. And and James, I I'd have the same question for you, um, but just adding, you know, being that you are you are a domestic distributor and you're also an international sales company, uh, do you ever have a preference on providing an MG on one versus the other? Um, and, and if maybe if you can talk a little bit about the value of providing an NG for the world, um, uh, versus one or the other, uh, I'm assuming that both are very important, but I would love to just get your input on that. <clears throat> well, well, thank you. I mean, I mean, our perspective might be a little different, um, from the acquisition strategies of, of our colleagues on the line here. Um, because we have such a heavy emphasis on the theatrical market in the United States, a, a theatrical release, when you're talking of over 100 screens, when you're getting into 200, 
200, 500, 750 screens or more, that endeavor in and of itself is very labor intensive. It's very expensive. It's very time consuming and it's very risky. That is a value proposition that we include in our offering when we are acquiring a film. And, and it's tough for us to put a number on that. So often when we go in early to get a film, some films are all about the numbers. Money goes in, money goes out. The analysis goes, you know, what's the return? And it's very much like a real estate transaction. Um, and for us, we do those as well. And, and I'm sure everyone on this film does those as well. You're making an assessment of what that <clears throat> what that minimum uh, guarantee is. XYZ mentioned earlier, that's just an assessment of risk. Um, and so that goes into the analysis that goes into the analysis of the film. For us, when we look at it, if there's a theatrical component, we Blue Fox Entertainment is fronting the PA for that film. And those PA costs can, can be significantly higher than a minimum guarantee advance. And so that makes the situation for the for the filmmakers as it relates to an MG a little bit of a murky situation because they're left with the scenario of do I take a high MG from a from a distribution company or from an international sales company? that is just gonna put the film out digitally or sell it to a streamer? Or do I take a lower number from Blue Fox Entertainment, but it has a high theatrical commitment in terms of screens. And, and that's that's basically assessment for the filmmakers to make. But but I just like to reiterate uh, and, and not lose sight of the fact of, of the comments made by the three other panelists. So you look at what Shout said, Fan-friendly fan content, XYZ, genre-focused. Juliet, making movies we want to see. What, what they're saying is commercial content. And, and all of these movies um, are going to require some level of equity. Somebody's going to have to write a check. And our role thereafter is to come in and try to augment that financial waterfall so that these films can get made and that these films can get out to, out to the market. But the, but the bottom line, and to those listening on this call, when you come to any of our companies, I suspect we're all looking for the same thing. And I think Julie said it best. We're looking for films that people want to see. And if people want to see your movie, you have a high likelihood that you're going to get interest from a presale or, or, or an advance or a minimum guarantee. And, and Jordan, I heard the same thing at, at, at the Toronto Film Festival. I was there. I had lunch with somebody. They said they pre-bought a film on the script stage. Blue Fox was interested in this film. I hadn't, we did not make a pre-buy. We wanted to see the film first. Yeah. And let's just say that uh, we didn't end up going after this movie. And I I, I just probably think that uh, the individual that the, you know, bought the film in advance, you know, look, that's the risk that they take. That's the risk that they all take. So again, yeah, it's trying, to, those, trying to get an advantage over, over the next one, you know, is, yes. uh, is, is, exactly. real, yeah. Um, well, thank you, uh, Juliet. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, your perspective is going to be unique today as you represent the independent producer um, as part of this panel. Um, and it, it, you, as I mentioned earlier, you produced the remake of Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. Um, and I'd love for you to uh, give us some insight on how much you had to package that film um, specifically uh, before exploring any pre-sales and the importance of having pre-sales as a whole on that title um, in order to close your financing. Um, and if you don't mind, if you can also just talk a little bit about going out with a recognizable IP um, and if that changed the dynamics at all for you um, on the quote unquote package and at what point you wanted to go out with that project. Yeah, sure. Um, that was something that I actually bought as a pitch at Treehouse and then took with me. Um, and when we heard the pitch, I'm always wary of remakes, but it is such a massive piece of IP domestically not so internationally which is someone something that we learned when we went to tell it but you know you go up to any one of a certain age in the u.s and you say you're doing delta mom the babysitter's done and then they say dishes are done man or some other line i'm right on top of that rose like everybody knows that movie has a really kind of cult following in a certain generation that was 
a big part of why we bought that other than liking the original and feeling like there was a reason to do a new version. Um, you know, it had its own story, it had its own approach and it feels like a movie on its own. But I will say having that IP was massively valuable to me in terms of going out to the marketplace. As you know, because we worked on that one together, we really piecemealed the finance plan. It was not a simple one to put together. There's an international piece, there's an SVOD piece, there's a theatrical piece, there's a tax credit, there's a product placement piece, and there's equity. So that was like a real quilt, um, which I think more and more I'm feeling is how you sometimes have to get a movie made. Um, you know, you always hope there's a, like, you know, a streamer that comes in and just writes a big check for a worldwide buy, but it doesn't always happen that way, as special as your project might be. It's not what they're looking for at that moment, or your cast doesn't fit the cast that they want, or, you know, everyone has their own kind of subjective value assessment of a project. So this one ended up coming together via all of those different deals that I mentioned. And I don't know that I would have been able to make those deals without having this IP behind me because IP really drives the marketplace these days, unless you have one of five movie stars. Um, yep. So, so I, I really, you know, I'm really feeling grateful that we had that because we were able to make this movie and it's really special and I'm in post on it now and I'm excited for the world to see it, but couldn't have done it without that. And, yep. and it's interesting to think about moving forward, um, you know, just how meaningful that is and how that helps get you the pre-sales that you need more so than just cast. Yeah, totally. Uh, so, so with that, you know, I, I want to ask everyone maybe a slightly different version of when do, does a producer go out with a package pre-sale? Um, and a, as a producer myself, one of the key questions I'm always thinking is when do I go? Um, you know, do I go with uh, a director attached? If it's a reputable director, do I need one actor? Uh, do I need two actors? Does it need to be a recognizable IP? If it's not, you know, at what point am I calling any of the folks on this panel? Um, so with that, you know, um, James, maybe just jump right back in with you. Can you please share some insight on what type of package you'd like to see in order to consider putting up a domestic and or international MG? Well, um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just speak obviously specifically to Blue Fox Entertainment and and uh, I'd be curious to get the thoughts of, of our other colleagues here. Um, I think first and foremost for us, when we digest and look at a, pro a project, um, that takes two things. It takes time and it takes money. The money in terms of we have people uh, looking at this particular project to make an assessment as to its value in the market. So before we even go down that route, what we like to see is some level of equity. But because I, I we we see very few films, and, and I'm sure it happens out there, but we just see very few films that actually go from the development stage all the way through to a consumer and to an audience that don't have any equity. So a, a film has to have some level of equity and depending on where the film is being made and depending on the budget, um, can impact the, the the percentages of equity that Blue Fox Entertainment looks for. But let's just assume that that's a significant um, level of equity. Um, so if, if the equity is there, the second thing we look for is probably what we've heard from the other panelists as well. And those are movies that people want to see. Those are movies that have a large market. Those are movies that fan-based or, or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and, and frankly, None of us on this call are immune to any of that. We watch, we watch movies to to laugh, to cry, um, to to be entertained, to feel inspired. Um, and if movies don't do that, and frankly, we've all seen a lot of great projects out there that don't do that, it's really tough to for us to equate a value to that. Um, and so for us, I think that to sort of summarize that, the two things we would look for is some type of financing involved. If a film comes to us and there's no financing, I think, boy, that just seems like a, a hell of a lot of work. Um, and the second thing we look for is it falls into a category of some type of commercial viability once it hits the consumer. So those yep. would be the two things that we look for. Yep. Um, and Maxime, you know, obviously XYZ is one of the most prestigious sales companies and have been for a while and, and um, for good reason. And I can only imagine the amount of material that goes through there. Um, I'd love to just ask the same question to you. Um, you know, at what point 
would you recommend producers come to XYZ for evaluation? Yeah, I wonder if I'm, one way to think of it is, is for us to make a decision, a concrete decision, whether it's to take on the movie, to sell it, to put up an MG, depending on which hat we're wearing, you need everything in place, right? But, and when I say everything, I mean the full package, right? But life isn't such that that always happens, right? It's not as simple as, you know, getting a complete package. And in fact, frankly, you were one of the, your movie that you have with us is one of the few that came to us basically fully packaged, ready to go, right? Um, so the real art for us is like kind of, it's finding movies at an earlier stage that we can guide towards getting to that end stage, right? And so, you know, if you if you look at the the various elements that go into the decision making process, right? It's kind of what everyone's already said on this this call, right? Which is to say, it's the filmmaking team, it's the actors, it's the concept and the story, and to a certain degree, it's the IP as well, right? And for us, the the two key elements before we even decide to even bother looking at it, for lack of a better expression, is the director and the concept, right? Because concept is the obvious point right creatively is it something we're into and therefore we think other people will be into and secondly the filmmaker for us always he's like the he or she are the most consistent element from you know a creative package that's to say somebody you can look at their past work and get a, a relatively good gauge of how their future work will be you know unlike let's say actors which are you know have less of an impact on that and therefore their careers are a little bit more um less consistent should i say and so for us that's kind of like the bare minimum is having those two elements then the next element becomes like how can we ameliorate the package in terms of cast you know i mean it's, i mean i think juliet you made the remark that there are like five movie stars left in the world it's, it's that is definitely an element you know it's like it's trying to fit one of the remaining people of value into the into the package but then it's also the other bits i mean uh, james you mentioned you know, having somebody with equity in the movie also demonstrates that there is a, a a backing and belief behind the project. Like it's to us, then it becomes that's the the phase between a a good script and filmmaker and a finished package is the kind of where we spend most of our work. Right? It's like trying to get it there. It's casting. It's figuring out creative financing solutions. It's figuring out ways. Like so much of what we do is, as you said, I mean we get, I don't know, something like 5,000 projects submitted us to a year, you know, a year, which is an insane amount of things to go through. And so we spent a lot of time devising a filtering system whereby it, you know, we have many layers to it. And the end, the goal there is to, out of the 5,000, identify 50 that are even worth getting into such that eventually you'll green light 20, right? And so it's, it's, so much of it is, having experience to go like, does this even have a realistic budget and finance plan? Does this even have the potential to attract interesting cast? You know, it's like, it's looking at those elements. So, you know, it's a long way of answering the question, you know, before we make a decision, we need every element in place, but it's that phase before, I think at the very minimum, we need a filmmaker and an interesting script. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and Jordan, just jumping into you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to ask a similar um, question as I asked to James and Maxime, but uh, also wanted, and, and Maxime touched on this, does the, the idea, if there's no talent on board, for example, on a project, but there's a director that you like a lot or have worked with or want to work with, um, you know, how much does the creative um, become a factor in you even being willing to uh, review a project with th that perhaps doesn't have any financing, doesn't have an actor attached, but has a filmmaker you like. And, and then on the flip side, also, you know, again, how, how important is talent? Um, and I know you're going to probably reiterate some of the things that Maxime and James said, but being the fact that you're a domestic distributor um, and, and one of the more sought after ones, I'd love to get your, your take on it. Well, I would say, we, we, you know, uh, of the titles that we acquire and release, I would say maybe 10 to 15% of them are these pre-buys. So we're incredibly selective about what we pursue. So such that the burden, the, the barrier to entry is pretty high. And, and, you know, your question about what kind how, how full does that package need to be? It needs to be pretty full. Mm -hmm. Um, if, 
if there's a great director, someone we've worked with, someone with a fantastic concept, that certainly gets us interested. But at the end of the day, uh, the MG we can offer is fueled 90% by cast. And it is an unfortunate fact of the business that cast is that much of a factor, actually, because you, you would love to believe that, you know, just a great story, well told, good actors is enough. And for us, at least, it's not. Um, we need, and you know, it all goes back, and, and this will be the running theme of the conversation, I imagine, um, Maxime's uh, two words, which could be the name of, you know, the Shout Factory band, which is risk mitigation. It is really all about that for us. Um, so another reason why mostly what we do is pick up uh, finished films, again, risk mitigation. There's much more risk in a pre-buy scenario. So um, when it comes to, the only time that's different is when it comes to our originals. And in that scenario, you know, we have IP. That The originals that Shout does is really focused on the IP that we own. We're not really looking to entertain third-party IP um, and develop it. We, we have, we you know, years ago we bought uh, Roger Corman's library. And by the way, Maxime, you were talking earlier about, you know, the the kind of the, uh, the early days of pre-sales. If Roger Corman didn't invent that, I don't know who did. I mean, because he used to sell movies and territories on a poster. No movie, no script, a poster. So, you know, that's, so So in any case, a lot of that IP is now Chout, and I'm looking to develop, you know, that IP for remakes and episodic and all this cool stuff. And in that scenario, we don't need cast attached. We need to find great creative, someone with a good take on it. Um, someone ideally we've worked with or we, whom we admire, and then we can start working on that. That's a whole different process than than just the pure distribution, where it's much more reliant on cast. And you mm -hmm. know, and and back to the whole, you know, there are five actors around, and and I can't tell you how many times a pre a package comes into me with the same five names, and and a lot of that is because those are the people you can afford to get for that particular budget. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's the nature of the, the current, uh, the, the state of the business now. Yeah. Can I that, mention something real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. I just want to, I just want to touch on, because you were starting this question by asking about building packages. Something that I think might be helpful to people is to remember packages are not a science. They're very subjective based on who's selling and who's buying. And so, if you have a good script, if you have a good piece of material, or you have some IP, if you have something that can attract a sales company early, then you're building not in a vacuum. I think the scariest thing for a producer is building a package in a vacuum because outside of those five names, there are a lot of fantastic actors who do have value. It's just not undeniable anywhere $100 million value. But it's not that there isn't anybody else. It's not like this and then this. So I think, you know, if I have a project and I'm thinking XYZ is the perfect place to sell this and I can get them invested early because of the strength of the material, then they can tell me, we just sold this movie last market with this actor tremendously well for us. Let's try to go get them because they'd be perfect in this. Same thing on the distribution side. Each distributor has a different list of, like the kinds of movies and the kinds of packages that work for them. So it, there isn't an algorithm. It's not like a, everybody approaches this in one way. It's not a one size fits all thing. So I think really focusing on the strength of your material and, and trying to bring partners in early to help build with you so that you can tailor your material to their needs and their market and all of that mm -hmm. is like, in my opinion, the best way to approach things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so I, I agree with everything everyone said i think um the other thing to note there is is it, it is not all doom and gloom just to be clear as well i would say the theme of this particular panel is to talk about pre-buys and pre-sales and that that particular aspect is very tied to cost still right but i think a lot of the points we made earlier is there are that paradigm of that one way of making independent films still exists but it is more particular. And so equally, we talked about all the different elements we look at in a film. You know, now we look at other elements, like say there is a very strong script, very strong filmmaker, very strong IP, but there's no actors. 
then we'll try other things to help you know ameliorate the risk profile right that that could be things like i don't know if you're lucky that the filmmaker might be just making up irish right and then you can tap into the irish funding body system and therefore actually have a huge amount of soft money that could bring down your risk so it's like i think the point is pre the pre-sale model is still very it still happens and is relevant but it is it's it's only one of the ways now i'd say to make an independent film and it's not you know the primary way anymore yeah and and uh you know one of the things that i always try to think about um when we're trying to package um is is who can we go to that's realistic that actually that actually moves the needle and is there a way to think out of the box at all from a casting perspective in order to generate pre-sales um i just want to throw that out there to anyone who wants to to answer but you know thinking about like for example going to an, uh, a musician who's a very recognizable name that maybe hasn't perhaps acted uh, going to an influencer which i'm sure everyone's seen that you know, so, somebody that has a massive audience, perhaps in a different vertical, um, is, is there is that is there something to that? Because I, I I try to think through like, all right, they're not getting approached every day, all day, like another actor or actress may be that that are on a lot of these movies. How can you think out of the box on a bring an element that would attract, excite you guys enough to want to lean into it? I'll just start with a part answer. Julia, you mentioned this whole point about when you're a producer, yeah, it's scary to package in a vacuum, right? And so, Patrick, there isn't a, in my opinion, a scientific answer to this, but so often it's like, look, we, each of our companies have a, a data set, right? And our data sets are like, they're not very big, to be honest, you know, they're like several dozen, several hundred films, and we each have a slightly different one. So it's like what Julia mentioned, it's like, we might just randomly have sold a film last year with insert name. And that really worked for us in a random bunch of territories. So we might suddenly be like, yeah, you know what? You know, Glenn Howerton's amazing, right? But then another sales agent might be like, never sold a Glenn Howerton film. You know, he hasn't got any traditional value in Western Europe. So it's a pass for me. So it is, there's a certain random aspect to it, you know? Um, I, I would say, therefore, part of this is, well, the answer is like, just, Try and ask as many different people as you can for opinions. You know, once you get, you know, it's like, you know, if everybody tells you you're drunk, sit down, you know, but like if, if, you know, you ask 10 people and, you know, two might say yes and eight might say no. It's kind of like it's, you're only to a certain degree as good as your salesperson believes in something. Um, if, if I may jump in for a second, just because uh, we, when that happens, so we often get into a situation where they've got, a cast member attached uh, or or a target like a like a, a warm target where i get um some pushback from you know my sales and marketing teams uh about the value of a package based on this cast is when an actor falls out uh and they and and the producer says and this happens all the time the producer will say what about this person okay well we might have a shot at this person it's the revolving door of cast that that where I get pushback because the truth is we don't have a lot of bandwidth to just constantly rerun our numbers based on this particular cast member. So that's why back to your uh, original question, Patrick, is, you know, I for shout at least we like to have, you know, firm attachments so that we really know if we're running our numbers and spending the time to discuss that and look at the, all the data that we're, that's the person we're going to get. Uh, James, do you have anything you want to share with that? Yeah, I I, um, I kind of want to echo what, what uh, Juliet said with regards to the 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 process of getting a a film from somebody's idea and then on, on a screen in front of a consumer is in in many ways is very very different. In these films, you know, what responds to to us might not respond to anyone else on this call. And and I think the idea of attaching, you know, even an interest, even without a financial commitment, but attaching the interest of a company like XYZ or Juliet, your company or, or Shout, um, I think really can help in the area of equity and getting financing. And we've often at Blue Fox, have, you know, and, and Patrick, you know this, we've gone into films and said, hey, we'll you know, 
we'll we'll sign an LOI or we'll sign a, distribu a distribution agreement right now, and we will give you theatrical, digital, international. We'll give you all these pieces and take that to your financier to give them some level of comfort that you won't make your film, end up getting into a terrific festival, and you have no distribution or international sales because that happens all the time. And I just think, Juliet, what you said, it's a good reminder because I think some of us in, in, in all these companies think of this is what we look for. This is what we want to do. But there's other ways to get films made and and there's other ways to entice and to get the interest of, of equity participants generally it's multiple people um, to help support these films and, and to get them on the ground. So that is another, certainly another way and an avenue of getting, you know, films from this early stage, uh, you know, looking for pre-sale and, and, and a pre-buy um, that, um, you, you know, getting somebody involved early might increase the equity contribution, which mm -hmm. mitigates the need to take the film out to the market to pre-sell it. Is that, and as Maxine said, Sometimes when you go take a market to pre-sell it, it's risk mitigation. You don't get enough sales. Therefore, your film's not going to get made. And, well, you're selling and, and at a discount, yeah. right? You're like, your your risk is being mitigated, but you're losing your upside on the Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and, and you know, and it, we all yeah. hear this. There's multiple announcements in front of every market. And, and can earlier this year, I don't remember how many uh, uh, pre-buys were out there, but by our count, I could be wrong. Our count was it was over forty that at projects that were announced, looking for financing, looking for a presale, and I would think that probably ten percent of those will ever get made because they took them to the market. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the activity there or the support, and so the team said this is a financial no go. Yeah, it's it's there's a there's an interesting balance, you know, from the producer's perspective, putting uh, my producer hat on. You know, um, how do you get the package? And we're, we're, we're our third panel discussion next month is going to all be about packaging. So we'll, we'll get into the weeds on this. But, you know, the challenge is, as a producer, how do I pack it? You know, if, if, if the distribution and the sales companies needs the solid package to evaluate, how do I do that unless I have the distribution or sales company that's willing to come in and, and help me package? Um, and I, I wonder, you know, and I'd love to get your guys' opinion on it, if there's ever you know, a vertical that that someone can create within your companies where maybe you're even charging something, some amount of money where you have a department or a person that, that can really work with people at the earliest stage to give them some guidance versus just waiting for them to show up on the front door with the full package. Um, because it, it feels like, the, I mean, I guess that the solution potentially is finding another producer like Juliet who really understands the packaging side and will be willing to put the work in um, uh, to help, you know, package it. But that's the the challenge between the two is like, how do you get to the point where you guys are interested? And I also just jumping into to Maxime, uh, you and I, you know, briefly discussed um, the the concern of going out with a project and talking to buyers and pre-selling it and ultimately having that movie fall apart. Um, and the reputational risk that you have um, within the marketplace. And that's why I believe one of the reasons why all, all of you on the distribution and sales side are very particular on going out with the, with the project that you feel that has a very high likelihood of getting financed because A, it could be a waste of time and B, it could look bad against the company that you're pre-selling films and aren't getting made. I'd love to get your opinion on that. <clears throat> I mean, you kind of said, I mean, very succinctly summarized another part of our analysis, right? Which is to say, when we look at something and let's say we determine this project, you know, the the maths say it requires so and so much in pre-sales to get financed. We have to then not only say what are the chances of getting that, but it's also, as you say, there's a reputational aspect. Because I think to answer this question a long way, you know, I think James, you just mentioned something about um because you know, all of this is very chicken and egg, right? And one of the ways of attracting someone, like I mentioned at the very beginning, we focus on genre films. That is not only because it happens to be what we like, but it's also it's what we're known for, right? So when we attach ourselves to something, to a genre film, it tells something to a buyer or to a casting agent that like, okay, this is like, this project has been effectively given a, 
stamp of approval by the quote unquote experts in that field, just as it would be weird for us to go to Cannes and say like, hey, look, I've got this Victorian era biographical drama, you know, that could be not necessarily our thing, right? And- that sounds amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I'd watch it, but um, uh, the, the point being, I think is, is, you know, so a lot of, you know, our stock in the market is based on our ability to convert things, right? So when we, when we, again, it comes back to the original factors, what we look at, when we take on something, we want to make sure that when we look at all the factors from filmmaker to creative to, you know, to the, to the budget, the finance plan, that it is, you know, nothing's a sure bet, but as close to a sure bet as possible. So that by the time we take it out to market, you know, we're not, you know, we're not taking something that that isn't then made, which then in turn, you know, eventually becomes a boy cried wolf thing, right? And mm -hmm. that would be the worst thing for us. That's, that's, you know, our reputation is key to getting movies made. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard to answer the question therefore, because it's like, again, this is what our job is, or my, effectively my day to day job is, is to take on a package and identify whether or not we deem this worthy of taking that risk of going to Cannes or Berlin or AFM or whatever and, and, and pre selling this movie. I, mm -hmm. I think it's worth it's worth noting that uh, with respect to the MG, the distribution MG, it's it's you know, you can't overestimate the the influence of the budget on this proposition because um, you know, I've many times I've I've had uh, producers come to me and say, well, this is I, I you know, your MG isn't high enough because I spent this amount of money on the movie. And my answer is always, well, my, our MG is not is not uh, determined by how much you spent on the movie. It's it's determined by how much we think we're going to how much revenue we think we're going to generate and what your royalty is going to be. And the advance will be a percentage of that royalty. That's it, pure and simple. It's a sales proposition, not how much you spent to make it. So, you know, adapting or, you know, a lot of times getting that movie made may involve, you know, changing the budget and which in turn could involve just bringing on different cast. But that changes the MG. It's it's like, you know, as Maxine said, it's chicken and the egg most of the time. And I can I just add one thing to that. I think one of the things I always recommend to producers is there's a the the way budgets are thought about is done very often the wrong way around where a producer will take a script and go like, oh, well, you know, based on this script, this movie is going to cost $5 million. Whereas the question is, should be more, how much is this movie worth? Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's how much I should make it for. And it's kind of, it's, it's easier said than done. It's really, really hard to be clear, but that's, it's a mindset that I think it's, it's much more pleasant dealing with producers from my perspective, who I have a conversation with and we can talk about, well, the value of this movie is X and therefore the budget should be Y as opposed to like, Hey man, like Jordan just said, like, hey man, my film cost $10 million. Why are you offering me two? And it's like, well, this has nothing to do with that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, totally. And and uh, I think it'd be good just to talk a little bit about the landscape today. Um, uh, you know, certainly given what's going on with the strike as part of it, but it feels like the uh, landscape has changed a lot, even in the last six months. Um, uh, from a from a pre-sale standpoint specifically. Um, and I'd love to, uh, Juliet, maybe just start off with you on, um, are you finding it more or less difficult to secure um, uh, uh, MGs and, and or pre-sales on your projects um, in today's climate? I don't know if I'm the person to start with. I will say I've been very fortunate in that I shot two movies back to back this year during two strikes. Um, the first one uh, was pre-SAG strike. And then the second one, we were like the third project to ask for a waiver, I think. So we ended up getting an interim agreement because it was low enough budget and all equity. Um, so I've been fortunate in that I've been focused on that and I haven't really had to think about the ramifications of, of trying to sell movies or get movies made in this landscape. Now, of course, I'm in post on these two things and I'm starting to think about what's next and I'm nervous, but I'd be more curious, I guess, to hear from the other side. I do know the people that I talk to, uh, it's not pretty. There's not a lot that can be done right now. I think it, well, I don't wanna speak for you guys because you are the buyers and the sellers, but it just <laughs> sounds like everyone's a little bit gun shy until there's more stability in the market. But I have been fortunate in that I haven't had to really- deal with it directly yet? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, James, can you elaborate a little bit just on the, the current landscape within Blue Fox and, you know, um, if that has changed at all in the last whatever quarter, six months, um, both on the domestic and international side? Um, well, I'll echo what Juliet said. I think Blue Fox's position in, in the industry is unique from the standpoint that uh, unlike a lot of films and, and companies, we don't require a transaction in the United States to go because we can release ourselves and we can release in theaters and we can go everywhere else. And we have the international sales team and we have our um, uh, alliance, Patrick, on the Blue Fox financing side. So we have a very broad perspective on how we view the market. Maxime and, and uh, Jordan, I, I, like Julie said, I'd love to hear your take. I mean, my view would be very, very high level. And, and I would put it into two buckets. And I would say the market for our industry is as robust as it's ever been. I would, I would assume that there's more people sitting around watching a content on a screen, regardless of how big it is, and we prefer the bigger screen. There's more people probably doing that today and spending more time doing that, unfortunately, instead of running around in the mountains than ever before. So that is the market. There's people consuming content all the time. Our industry is, well, I'll use my words carefully. We're not on life support, but our industry historically has been very, very fragmented outside of the studio system. When you look at the independent side of things, it's it's a very fragmented, a la carte, way too many movies, very low barrier to entry, no quality control. And as a result, there's just this coming together of stuff that frankly isn't very well managed. I mean, look at our, we have multiple strikes going on today. You have the pay one and the streaming companies that are all in turnaround. You have like all of these and, and the movie theaters coming out of COVID. And, and uh, you know, I could go on and talk about the state of the industry. Um, but I don't think Patrick, that the state of the industry is going to, is going to change anytime soon. I think the independent film market will always be a little bit of the Wild West. The good news is, is that the market is solid. So the question is, listening to, you know, getting the insight of you on this panel and other experts in our field, is how do you navigate an, a, a, an industry that is, I, I would say, in large measure, poorly managed? How do you find those great movies and those great opportunities to serve a very active and consuming market? Because there are people consuming film and television content all of the time, and they need new content all of the time. And the question for us on this panel is, and in our industry, how do we do that in an efficient and in a financially responsible way to ensure the, the viability of our industry going forward? So mm -hmm. I would say that sort of those, those two buckets in terms of the state of the, state of the industry, uh, you know, currently, I don't, the industry, nothing to write home about. The market, however, I think is it, 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 there are of people paying for content in some way, shape or form is probably as large as it's ever been. And the question is, is how do we get content to those consumers? Uh, and uh, Jordan, I definitely want to ask you your perspective, too. But I want to just start off with Maxime, just because he could also mention the international side. Um, you know, we're, we have a project together, Maxime, as you know, that. We've been waiting for three months, close to three months, to get a waiver on a fully financed film, and and it's incredibly frustrating because we do have no affiliation with the AMP uh, TP um, uh, companies, and I, I can only imagine for you, Maxime, as a slate from a slate standpoint, not even just with the strike um, happening uh, and get waiting for waivers, but just the pay one windows disappearing or mitigating. Um, are, are you trying to uh, internally figure out ways how to maxim maximize revenue streams right now? Um, ha has the uh, landscape changed for you guys a lot in the last six months? And if so, if you can give us some you know examples of how. Yeah, I mean, it certainly has. And it's undeniably way harder. I'd say I'd echo a lot of what James just said. On the one hand, the good news is there are indeed more consumers than ever consuming content. But I would offset that positive news with the fact that the way um, from an independent film 
production POV, um, the way that's been monetized, the way we take advantage of that, especially in light of its fragmented nature, um, has really gone against us. That is to say, it, you have to ask to, to understand why it's become hard is look at what the business model is of a typical international distributor, which is basically the same as US distributor, right? A distributor takes on the rights to a movie and exploits it in as many windows as it can, right? And from theaters to TV to, to you know, streaming to DVDs. Problem is nobody buys home video anymore or rarely, right? So the DVD, I mean, actually shout is one, yeah, of, the few, one of the few that- Yeah, exactly. shining lights yeah. on this front. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, but certainly internationally, that, was, that used to be a huge part of the business and that's no longer the case. Um, you know, the a lot of countries outside of the US and Western Europe, streaming hasn't quite caught on as much as we're used to it. You know, so it's so a lot of, you know, a, a huge swathe of the world um, doesn't have significant streaming revenues. And then also even theatrical, you can't forget that the, the way it's changed to a large degree is international markets, tastes have changed a lot. So for to a large degree in international markets, people are either watching the US studio blockbuster or local content. What they're no longer watching as much of is the English language independent movie which used to be, you know, a, a significant part of their consumption, but just no longer is because the countries have caught up in terms of local production. So again, the average consumer wants to either watch a Marvel movie or the latest local comedy, you know, based on their own culture. So it just means that overall from every single angle, there's just less and less opportunity for an English language independent movie to be monetized internationally. That's translated into lower pre-sales and lower sales value in general. So... That is very doom and gloom, but it is doom and gloom. It's just, it means that we as independent filmmakers now have had to adapt the way we put our movies together, the way we think about monetizing movies. And, you know, it's the, the one, the reason why I'm still glass half full is kind of, again, James alluded to this, is this industry's always been so the Wild West, so to speak. And so navigating the Wild West has always required being flexible and figuring out different ways to get things made. So I don't think conceptually anything's changed in that sense um it's just now that particular shift i've described has been kind of more marked than it certainly has been over the last 30 40 years so it's just you know we're right in the eye of the storm i think at the moment and we're just trying to figure that out and so mm -hmm. you know it, it's it means that yeah it's just it's it's so much harder i think the u.s market in particular has been relatively protected i mean jordan i'm sure you'll agree and James as well. I mean, the market's been more difficult the last year than it was before, but it's still been relatively protected because, you know, there's still a lot of consumers here that want to watch our movies. But internationally, it's tough. You know, it's really, really tough. Yeah, I was going to mention, Jordan, you know, is, uh, and, and you alluded, alluded to it, Maxime, um, are, are you able to navigate the waters a little bit more clearly, Jordan, being that your sole focus is on domestic and you have projects coming to you. Um, is there is there uh, other challenges on the domestic distribution side that is w warranted, you know, mentioning, um, or is it same as uh, normal business as it would have been, say, six months ago? Oh, due to due to the strikes? Um, no, no, not not even the strikes. The the strikes, yes, the strikes uh, as one element, but I I'm not even talking just about the strike. Just generally acquiring the 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 amounts of money that that you guys would put particularly uh put up as a minimum guarantee or and even for uh marketing uh of a film has the landscape changed a lot in the last six months for you um i don't th well yes uh to the extent uh, you referenced earlier the pay one windows are are fewer and further between these days um, and I think that's a, a reflection of some of the instability at these streamers and, and mandates change, people go away. Um, it's a little um, Kafkaesque and, you know, those those companies, you know, you never know where you are and who needs what. Um, so to that extent, yes. I mean, for us, at least, again, risk mitigation, uh, we like those pay one deals because that's the only money you can absolutely count on. And, you know, the rest of it is all very educated guessing. It's all, you know, our, right. our transactional projections, our physical projections, we're good at those, 
but it's still at the end of the day, a guess, and um, you could come in higher or lower. So um, I think the one of, one of the one of the nice things about um, the model, the business that Shout has built over the years, uh, especially with respect to our uh, our AVOD, SVOD, and FAST channels, is that we have a great alternative uh, to a pay one window. Um, and we're even doing some exclusive deals there, but you know, in a, in a, in a scenario where we don't find the pay one deal at all, or at least a number that we like, we can release it to uh, to those channels. It's still a guess at the end of the day. It's still not money in the bank. So to that extent, yes. Uh, and and while um, uh, while I wouldn't say that I while I would say that the uh, the death of DVD, you know, reports of the death of DVD have been greatly exaggerated. Yes, of course, there has been a standard decline over the years, and 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 we've seen our our digital business eclipse our physical business, which was a big milestone in the history of our company. It was, you know, we started out as a physical business, and mm -hmm. for years it was just that was what led, and now it's really uh, it's really finally changed. And um, but you know that's evolution. Yep, uh, Jordan. Real quickly, I'm just uh, glancing at some of the questions being asked. Um, a lot of people are asking what a pay one window is. If you don't mind, oh. just just explaining that. Hey, a pay, uh, thank you. Um, yes, a pay one. It's a licensing deal to a, a streamer or a broadcaster. It's really what it is. Um, it's so if we really, you know, we'll, our first window is usually theatrical and then we'll um, launch a digital window after that, after a period of time, um, you know, for, for rental and, and, and uh, purchase. And then the pay one window is that first licensing window. So it's Netflix, Hulu, but even these days you could, you know, get a pay one deal from Tubi, for example. Um, so that's that's that streaming window. That's pay one. Getting a, a number of questions coming in, asking about just estimates in general. Um, can can you guys maybe uh, explain a little bit at what point would you be willing to come in and provide estimates on a project? that you are interested in? I mean, my yeah. short answer is, is yeah. once we've been submitted something and it gets through our own internal kind of first two or three layers of, of review, it would only be at the point that we want to seriously pursue something, you know, because, it, you know, we have a, a limited amount of bandwidth that we can actually spend on doing that because estimates are, equal parts finger in the air and a lot of work you know so they are they they it's a lot of work and when we get five thousand submissions a year we need to be very careful as to um you know when we do that and so you know what what i would hesitate to say is it would never be the case that someone sends you something you're like great here are our estimates you know it just wouldn't it wouldn't work like that it would have to be something where again we've collectively across every department identified that or determined that this project has legs, you know, has something that means it's something we should pursue. That'd be my answer. Yeah, that makes sense. And James, do you, do you, do you share in that? Uh, is there any, anything else that you would want to add to that on someone going to Blue Fox Entertainment to provide estimates to help them, um, in, in, in whether it's helping to secure financing, whether it's helping to secure talent, um, how do you typically handle that? I, I think I would echo what Maxime said, and that would be, it, it would have to be something that is a, a compelling project. And again, as was said before, I think Julia mentioned, it's, it's so subjective. I mean, what we might love, Jordan will say, you guys are complete and total idiots for, you know, supporting that movie. But Look, that's the beauty of the industry. And and sometimes all you need is one yes. And if there's just one yes from somebody on this call, you're golden. Um, but even with that, again, it's really just a, a resource issue that to do estimates for us, it's, you know, it's a very serious game. It's a very serious business. It takes several team members, multiple hours to do that on one film. And so when you're, I mean, thank God people don't have my email, Maxine, because the 5,000 things came in. I mean, it would just, grind to a halt so we'll keep sending recommendations to you because it sounds like you're the go-to yeah, no, um, <laughs> filter all this uh but i think look you know we we're happy when we find a project that we can do estimates on it makes us very excited because that means that something is out there that's commercial that has you know some of the key pieces that we look for um but yeah it would very rarely be somebody sends us something and we 
drop everything and spend four or five hours and devote two or three team members to doing estimates. That's, it, it takes us time to do that. Yeah, and don't forget, do you remember we also talked about the reputational aspect? Like for companies like us, the relative accuracy of our estimates is to a large degree our lifeblood, right? right. It is it is something that we have spent 15 years getting, you know, every bank and financier in the business to consider our estimates to be reliable. And so, you know, again, it's just another element to why for something to get to that stage where we spend the real work to getting something we feel comfortable with, you know, it, it needs to have passed multiple sniff tests. Uh, also, I can, I would love to add that um, we, we, occasionally we will, um, entertain we will we will propose a a deal that does not involve an mg um and when that happens uh if the producer is still on the phone with me then <laughs> they will they will they may say okay but let's hear your sales projections you know your low medium and high estimates so um and that's, you know, we like those because, you know, no MG, very little, less, less risk. Um, but those estimates, back to the reputational uh, issue, have to be not crazy. You know, they have to, you, can, you can't just blow up estimates to get the deal and get the producers excited about, oh, they think they're going to make $10 million. If, if you're not even close to that, and, and that's the last time you, you get to do that. So, um, it's it's really important to be real about it all, you know, to really because look, if it doesn't work out, they should have they should be working with someone who who can achieve their goals. And if we can't achieve it through our estimates, that's fine. But I would hate to overpromise and under under deliver. Yeah, I will say, you know, with our with our marketplace that we have where we provide uh, debt and gap financing. When you're on the gap side, um, and and we're even taking a project in to consider whether or not we could be helpful. There's two things that we look at first and foremost, you know, it's one of a handful of international sales companies uh, or, or domestic distributors that we actually believe the estimates because of exactly what you're saying. There's, there's so many that will just throw numbers in to get the deal. You have to really trust it. Um, and then on the flip side is you have to then go to lenders that feel comfortable on those estimates so whether it's Blue Fox, um, whether it is uh, Shout or XYZ, um, you guys, you said at Bex Maxime, you spent 15 years building a reputation up of your estimates that is solid enough where you can go to a lender and they'll lend against the estimates because they trust them. Um, and, and, and same, you know, for all three of you. Um, so yeah, I, 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 there's only we only have a couple more minutes left. I, I wanted to just ask you, Juliet, um, just to, off topic a little bit, but you know, and dealing with uh, don't tell mom the babysitter's dead together is you know what's the advantage and disadvantage sometimes of pre-selling of being at, being fortunate enough to pre-sell your film, and how could that potentially limit you from an equity perspective if you're limited on the amount of open territories you have left to sell the equity component. You know, there's a balance there of trying to make sure that you can close all of your financing and make everyone happy. Absolutely. I mean, I kind of touched on it earlier, but obviously the advantage of pre-sell in your film is A, you, you have the money to go make your movie. You know what your risk is and you have some sort of security. A lot of times also it allows you to build your package or your cast in a way you might not have been able to if you were going into the marketplace. And, you know, if, if your distributor says, yeah, we'll sign off on this person and that's your director's first choice, you can do that even though maybe that person might not be as quote unquote meaningful. So I think that's that's a value of pre-selling and just the security of, of knowing you have that kind of risk-free money in the bank. But I think you're absolutely capping your upside when you pre-sell a movie. Um, you, you know, everyone's buying it for a bit of a discount because of what you said, because it's sight unseen, because there's that risk factor that they don't know what they're going to get. And because you can't leverage competition typically. I mean, you can sometimes if you have a really strong package, you can have multiple offers to pre-buy. But if you're in that situation, my perspective is if you have the ability, if you already have competition at a pre-sale level and you have the ability to go make your movie and then sell it and you believe in the quality of what you're making, 
you're always better off selling it later. Um, but there is that question of what if it doesn't get into a festival? Then you're in a really bad position because you don't have a market, you don't have a festival launch, all of those things. So I think there's there's you know risks and and benefits of of both versions, and I think you have to kind of weigh what's the best path towards production, um, and and also you know where do I like how much do I really believe this thing is going to be worth in the end, and hopefully if you're producing something, everything you think is going to be worth you know a blockbuster, but. But, you know, I would always rather not pre-sell, to be honest, but you're not always in that position. And and the security of knowing that you already have partners on board from the beginning, even being able to sometimes show them early cuts or build it with them and have their marketing team weigh in early, the, those things can be massively valuable, but you're leaving money on the table. Yeah. Um, I know we're, we're hitting the tail end and Jordan, you have to, you have a hard out, but uh, maybe we can just end um, on everyone just, if there's any advice or tips that you can give filmmakers that perhaps we haven't discussed on, you know, how to properly package their project and, you know, what, what they could be doing in order to help, you know, get a company like you or a producer like you excited, uh, I think would be helpful. Uh, Jordan, you want to jump in? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, my advice is to to uh, don't give up. Um, my advice is that to keep um, talking to uh, distributors because not every distributor has the same uh, risk tolerance level. And um, there are distributors who, first of all, and also know what those distributors are looking for. So, for example, if somebody came to me with just a, a you know a nice quiet drama, I, I wouldn't. It, it's just not what we do. Um, so move on, you know, find that company that, 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 uh, distributes those and, and does them well and has a reputation, all that. But, um, I would say, uh, don't give up because, um, the, the, and also the, the, you have a better shot at, 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 uh, at making a distributor feel like there's less risk involved, uh, the more compelling your packages. Of course, that seems kind of ob stating the obvious, but for us, at least I can just say cast, and um cast and one other cast that was the <laughs> uh james how about you um i i probably would would go back to um some of the comments that our colleagues on this panel have made and that is uh, making movies that people want to watch and um look i i, I you know it's such it's such a subjective business i know but at the end of the day, if you're not making somebody scared, laugh, cry, inspired, you know, there's a couple of these buckets. If you're not doing that, then don't quit your day job because the amount of competition, just look at what XYZ is seeing every year. The amount of competition is steep. Do not underestimate the amount of quality and work that's going to be needed to get to that top tier. You, uh, but it can be done. And as Jordan said, you know, if, if you have a mission and you have a passion and you have a, a, a vision and it falls into one of those buckets and, and you personally would actually watch this film, if it wasn't your production, if you would watch it, then I think you probably have a decent shot of getting it made and into the market. Yeah, very, very helpful. Uh, Maxime, how about yourself? Um, hard to add much because I think you guys are all right. Um... Perhaps I would add form a team. What I mean by that is is partner up with people. Try to bring people onto your project who bring a different skill set or value add to your proposition. You know, I think um, I don't think there's any uh, glory in going it all on your own. I mean, good for you if that means you're the one who you know picks up the Oscar at the speech, but um, it's. Yeah, it's all about, you know, so so much of it is finding people who have complementary skills to what you have, you know, and who can bring something to the table that's valuable. That's what I would yeah, advise. Yeah, I think, I think it's incredibly important. We didn't touch on that, I think, even enough of, you know, being able to approach any one of you your companies, um, having somebody that has that experience and perhaps relationship um, that can make those phone calls is extremely helpful. So, you know, that with that said, Juliet, you know, I, th I think you as an independent producer, obviously, I'd love to hear any tips that you have 
And, and also maybe just add to, you know, at what point should someone call you um, with a project for you to consider? Yeah, I mean, I guess my, everyone said it so well, and I would have echoed what everyone said. I guess my biggest piece of advice would be know why you want to make this film and what you're trying to say and be able to passionately articulate that because if you can't do that, you're not going to be able to convince a director or an actor or a sales company or a distributor. So much of your job is being able to, to advocate for why this movie should be made when there are so many other movies out there that don't get made. Why should this be the one? And if you have that passion, you believe in that, and you have that conviction, then you can get everyone else to follow you. It's really hard to make a movie. And we all work so hard and we spend a lot of time and energy and we like really bleed for this thing. So it has to start with that. And if you can't answer that question, then you're wasting your time. If it's just because it's like something else that was successful or because you think it's cool. To answer your question, I look at things at any stage, but just believe that this is the best version of the script that possibly exists before you send it to me, but I'm happy to look at things clean. I don't want to look at a draft. I don't want to look at something that needs work. I want to look at the thing that you can stand behind and say, this is the best it's ever going to be. And then we'll work on it together. <laughs> well, thank you everybody for jumping on and staying on the whole 90 minutes. And thanks everyone who's still uh, listening to this. We appreciate it. Um, very insightful. Um, and, and I look forward to working with all of you guys, you know, in the near future. Yeah, uh, thank you, it. Patrick. I really appreciate that. And thanks to all the, you know, the panelists for sharing your expertise as well. I just want to let everybody know there will be a recording of the webinar that will be made available early next week. Uh, for anyone who has not purchased a badge for AFM, we encourage you to do so before the prices go up on October 7th. You can find out more information about AFM on AmericanFilmMarket.com. Um, thank you for listening, and we hope to see you at our next finance webinar next month. Thank you.